Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the three most annoying pieces of classical music you could possibly choose to try and fall asleep to. This is a real issue. I don't know about you, but my partner, Sean, and I, well, we have very different tastes. And sometimes, you know, we listen to television and he wants to watch one thing and I want to watch another, or we want to listen to music and he likes rap music and R&B and you know what I like. So we have to decide what we're going to listen to. And we all pick our selections. And you know, the interesting thing is, as long as everything's at a low enough volume, it really doesn't make any difference. I don't have any trouble falling asleep, and he doesn't have any trouble falling asleep. But there are some things that really, really do not work. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you what they are. The three pieces of music that you should never, ever play for your partner when you are trying to fall asleep and they are trying to fall asleep more importantly because you do not want to have a late night eruption the first of them and once we talk about these we'll figure out some sort of psychological reason why this is true the first of them i mean the most obnoxious difficult thing i have ever attempted to fall asleep to was Manuel de Falla's Master Peter's Puppet Show. Now, why is this so irritating? I mean, it's, it's Manuel de Falla, you know, the apotheosis of Spanish elegance and poise and clarity and precision and, and you know, just wonderful, wonderful music polished to a to a fine fine sheen you know everything he did but master peter's puppet show holy crap it could wake the dead <laughs> i am not kidding well let's let's figure out why shall we first of all the piece itself is a scene from don quixote and it's written in the most dry brittle ironic way there's like a major part for a harpsichord. It's, you know, harpsichord and xylophone. I mean, there's very little lyrical music about it. And it's scored for a very strange chamber ensemble in which wind instruments sort of predominate. And so, and so it's always kind of thumping and bumping and clicking and clacking. And it's not the kind of thing that's going to lull you off to slumberland. But the worst thing about it is the vocal writing. Holy Moses. Let me tell you what, what Defia says himself about the vocal parts. It's here in the score. He writes, notes on the manner of performance. The three singers should make a point of avoiding every kind of theatrical mannerism in their vocal style. I have no idea what that means. The part of Don Quixote, and there are only three parts, should be sung with a sense of nobility and dignity, which partakes equally of the sublime and the ridiculous, while the interpretation of all the marks of expression in the music should be exaggerated down to the smallest detail. The proper performance of the part demands a voice which is nervous and energetic, as well as rich in tone and flexible and in expression. So we're already talking about nervous and energetic, which is not what you want when you're trying to sleep. In the part of Master Peter, the singer should try to avoid all excess of lyrical feeling. On the other hand, he should cultivate the greatest possible clearness and vivacity of musical diction, which means it's going to sound like somebody yelling at you the entire time, within the range of vocal color demanded by each situation of the drama. There should be no attempt at buffoonery, but the roguish and ironical disposition of the character should be conveyed by a decidedly comic manner. So somebody is speaking in your ear, but the worst part, oh God, the worst part comes from the boy, which is a boy soprano. The part of the boy demands a voice which is rather nasal, which is nasal and rather forced. The voice of a boy shouting in the street, rough in expression and exempt from all lyrical feeling. It should be sung by a boy soprano, but when this is not possible, a woman's voice, high mezzo soprano, may be used, which will imitate the characteristic vocal quality and the kind of expression mentioned above. Okay, you get the picture. So what you basically have is three people screaming at you in Spanish with instruments making a kind of dry spasmodic commentary behind them. Now, 
don't get me wrong. The piece is a masterpiece of its kind. It's brilliantly written. It has all of Faya's characteristic style and, and, and elegance and polish and all of those qualities. But don't try to sleep to it. It will make you crazy. Absolutely make you crazy. Now, <clears throat> the second kind of music you absolutely cannot play is contemporary classical music. And I don't mean, you know, things like Schoenberg. Schoenberg you can sleep to very easily for the most part. You know, it's music that has to be continuous. This is an interesting, an interesting sort of psychological fact, because even when you're sleeping or drowsy, you're following the music somehow. I, I can't explain it. Maybe someone else can, but you, you follow the course of the music and you have expectations, unconscious expectations even. And if they're not satisfied, you get frustrated, you get alarmed and it wakes you up. And I'm talking about people like, like my, my, my exemplar for this is, is Georgian composer Ghia Cancelli. Now Ghia Cancelli is a wonderful composer, but he was famous for writing music, which is very, 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 very quiet and then incredibly loud with no warning whatsoever. So, I mean, this is an obvious one, right? You can't find a volume level that allows you to hear the soft bits and will allow the quiet bits not to drive you nuts when they explode for seemingly no reason whatsoever. Ken Shelley is absolutely terrible if you're trying to sleep. Now, that doesn't mean some of his music isn't boring. I mean, you may not even want to hear it while you're awake. It's just the nature of the stuff. This sort of spasmodic, discontinuous in terms of dynamics. Dynamically discontinuous music is absolutely impossible to get comfortable sleeping to. And I guarantee, I guarantee that if you try, you will be terribly unsuccessful. However, <clears throat> however, the worst music ever to try and sleep to. And I have never experienced anything quite like this in terms of the discomfort it causes is Scarlatti Sonatas. <laughs> Believe it or not, Scarlatti Sonatas. And in a sense, they embody all of the most irritating characteristics that music can have. First of all, they are relentlessly vivacious. I mean, they are so motorically exciting. It, you know, they just, they're just delightful. I mean, we love them, right? When we're awake and alert, what could be more fun than a Scarlatti Sonata? And the disc that really did it, that almost destroyed my relationship was this one. This was Scott Ross playing the most beautiful Scarlatti Sonatas, Les Plus Belles Sonates, the best sonatas. No, 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 they may be the best, but they are not suitable for sleeping, I assure you. Then there's the sound of the harpsichord itself. It's just the opposite of Cancelli. It's dynamically monotonous. But here's a fabulous psychological psychological effect. No matter no matter how quietly you turn the volume down, it sounds loud. It sounds loud because the harpsichord is a mechanical instrument that's just relentlessly persistent. And so it winds up sounding like like, you know, some sort of, some sort of like a jackhammer, especially in Scarlatti, because he writes those sonatas that have those rapid repeated notes like machine gun fire. It's chugga 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 when you're trying to sleep, they will absolutely make you crazy. It's like it's like somebody driving a nail into your brain <laughs> listening to Scarlatti. And the interesting thing is that it's not the same on the piano. If you play it on the piano, it's okay. You can sleep. You can do it. You can find a volume and you can sleep. And it's ironic, but when you play it on a harpsichord, that instrument for which these pieces are really written. And I personally think that however spectacular Scarlatti performances are on the piano, they are clearly written for the harpsichord and for what the harpsichord can do. And, and they sound best on a harpsichord. And Scott Ross uses 
beautiful, beautiful sounding harpsichords. They're marvelous sounding, but don't try to sleep to them. I assure you, it will be a punishment like you can't possibly imagine and may very well spell the end of a beautiful, harmonious relationship with your significant other. So those are my three suggestions. I'm wondering what yours are. I'll bet you've got some experience of trying to put on some music and just relax and it just doesn't go there. But, you know, it's interesting to figure this out and to kind of think about why. And I, I do believe even when we're sleeping, we are conscious of music, of music happening, of the flow and the logic behind it. And there are certain pieces, I mean, I can listen to a Mahler symphony at low volume and fall asleep to it because it has the logic and the continuity. And I can take it all in in, in, a, in a passive way. You can also take it in in an active way. You, you, you know, the two things are not mutually exclusive, but some music is conducive to the sort of passivity that you acquire in the sleep mode. And some music absolutely forbids it. There is nothing you can do about it. And for my money, Scarlatti Sonatas on the harpsichord will be the kiss of death. You know, also, one final thought about this. You know, it occurs to me that, you know, you begin to understand the story behind Bach's Goldberg variations. Remember, which was that, you know, Count Kaiserlink or whatever his name was, couldn't sleep. He had insomnia. And so he needed something to help him pass the time during his sleepless nights. And, you know, the Goldberg variations were not written to put him to sleep. They were written to keep him up and to keep him engaged while he was up. And they do that because that's what harpsichords do. They keep you up. They stab at you. But when you're in a good mood, when you're in the mood to accept what they have to offer, they're absolutely marvelous. But when you aren't, they are the the, the torture of a thousand scorpions. <laughs> you know, and it's just horrifying. So anyway, folks, those are my suggestions. You can take them or leave them. You can try them out if you dare. Take care and keep on listening, but choose wisely if you plan on sleeping. Bye-bye.